Just as nothing that contains life can exist without getting rid of its wastes, so the archipelago could not keep swirling about without precipitating to the bottom its principal form of waste, the last leggers. And everything built by the archipelago had been squeezed out of the muscles of the last leggers before they became last leggers. And those who survived, who reproach the last leggers with being themselves to blame, must take upon themselves the disgrace of their own preserved lives. And among the surviving, the orthodox communists now write me lofty protests. How base are the thoughts and feelings of the heroes of your story, one day in the life of Ivan Denisovich. Where are their anguished cogitations about the course of history? Everything is about bread rations and gruel, and yet there are sufferings much more unbearable than hunger. Oh, so there are. Oh, so there are indeed much more unbearable sufferings, such as sufferings of orthodox thought. You in your medical sections and your storerooms, you never knew hunger there, orthodox, loyalist, gentlemen. It has been known for centuries that hunger rules the world, and all your progressive doctrine is incidentally built on hunger, on the thesis that hungry people will inevitably revolt against the well-fed. Hunger rules every hungry human being, unless he has himself consciously decided to die. Hunger, which forces an honest person to reach out and steal, when the belly rumbles, conscience flees. Hunger, which compels the most unselfish person to look with envy into someone else's bow, and to try painfully to estimate what weight of ration his neighbor is receiving. Hunger, which darkens the brain and refuses to allow it to be distracted by anything else at all, or to think about anything else at all, or to speak about anything else at all except food, food, and food. Hunger, from which it is impossible to escape even in dreams, dreams are about food, and insomnia is over food, and soon just insomnia. Hunger, after which one cannot even eat up, the man has by then turned into a one-way pipe, and everything emerges from him in exactly the same state in which it was swallowed. And this, too, the Russian cinema screen must see, how the last leggers, jealously watching their competitors out of the corners of their eyes, stand duty at the kitchen porch, waiting for them to bring out the slops in the dishwater. How they throw themselves on it and fight with one another, seeking a fish head, a bone, vegetable parings and how one last legger dies killed in that scrimmage, and how immediately afterward they wash off this waste and boil it and eat it. And inquisitive cameramen can continue with their shooting and show us how, in 1947, in Dolinka, Bessarabian peasant women who had been brought in from freedom hurled themselves with that very same intent on slops which the last leggers had already checked over. The screen will show bags of bones which are still joined together, lying under blankets at the hospital, dying almost without movement, and then being carried out. And on the whole, how simply a human being dies. He was speaking, and he fell silent. He was walking along the road, and he fell down. Shudder, and it's over. How, in camp at Unja and Nuksha, the fat-faced, socially friendly worker signer jerks a zek by the legs to get him out to line up, and he turns out to be dead, and the corpse falls on its head on the floor. Croaked, the scum! And he gaily gives him a kick for good measure. At those camps during the war there was no doctor's aid, not even an orderly, and as a result there were no sick, and anyone who pretended to be sick was taken out to the woods in his comrade's arms, and they also took a board and a rope along so they could drag the corpse back the more easily. At work, they laid the sick person down next to the bonfire, and it was to the interest of both the Zex and the convoy to have him die the sooner. What the screen cannot catch will be described to us in slow, meticulous prose, which will distinguish between the nuances of the various paths to death, which are sometimes called scurvy, sometimes pellagra, sometimes alimentary dystrophy. For instance, if there is blood on your bread after you have taken a bite, that is scurvy. From then on, your teeth begin to fall out, your gums rot, 
Ulcers appear on your legs, your flesh will begin to fall off in whole chunks, and you will begin to smell like a corpse. Your bloated legs collapse. They refuse to take such cases into the hospital, and they crawl on all fours around the camp compound. But if your face grows dark and your skin begins to peel and your entire organism is racked by diarrhoea, this is pellagra. It is necessary to halt the diarrhoea somehow, so they take three spoons of chalk a day, and they say that in this case if you can get and eat a lot of herring, the food will begin to hold. But where are you going to get herring? The man grows weaker, weaker, and the bigger he is, the faster it goes. He has already become so weak that he cannot climb to the top bunks. He cannot step across a log in his path. He has to lift his leg with his two hands, or else crawl on all fours. The diarrhea takes out of a man both strength and all interest in other people, in life, in himself. He grows deaf and stupid, and he loses all capacity to weep, even when he is being dragged along the ground behind a sledge. He is no longer afraid of death. He is wrapped in a submissive, rosy glow. He has crossed all boundaries and has forgotten the name of his wife, of his children, and finally his own name too. Sometimes the entire body of a man dying of starvation is covered with blue-black pimples like peas with pus-filled heads smaller than a pinhead, his face, arms, legs, his trunk, even his scrotum. It is so painful, he cannot be touched. The tiny boils come to a head and burst, and a thick worm-like string of pus is forced out of them. The man is rotting alive. If black, astonished head lice are crawling on the face of your neighbor on the bunks, it is a sure sign of death. Fie! What naturalism! Why keep talking about all that? And that is what they usually say today, those who did not themselves suffer, who were themselves the executioners, or who have washed their hands of it, or who put on an innocent expression. Why remember all that? Why rake over old wounds? Their wounds. Lev Tolstoy had an answer for that, to Biryukov. What do you mean, why remember? If I have had a terrible illness and I have succeeded in recovering from it and been cleansed of it, I will always remember gladly. The only time I will refuse to remember is when I am still ill and have got worse, and when I wish to deceive myself. If we remember the old and look it straight in the face, then our new and present violence will also disclose itself. I want to conclude these pages about last leggers with NKG's story about the engineer Lev Nikolaevich Y. Indeed, this must, in view of the first name and patronymic, be in honor of Tolstoy. A last legger theoretician who found the last legger's pattern of existence to be the most convenient method of preserving his life. Here is how the engineer Y occupies himself in a remote corner of the camp compound on a hot Sunday. Something with a resemblance to a human being, sits in a declivity above a pit in which brown, peaty water has collected. Set out around the pit are sardine heads, fish bones, pieces of gristle, crusts of bread, lumps of cooked cereal, wet, washed potato peelings, and something in addition which it is difficult even to name. A tiny bonfire has been built on a piece of tin, and above it hangs a soot, blackened soldier's mess tin containing a broth. It seems to be ready. The last legger begins to dip out the dark slops from the mess tin with a wooden spoon and to wash down with them one after another the potato peelings, the gristle, then the sardine heads. He keeps chewing away very, very slowly and deliberately. It's the common misfortune of last legger to gulp things down hastily without chewing. His nose can hardly be seen in the midst of the dark grey wool that covers his neck his chin, his cheeks. His nose and his forehead are a waxy brown color, and in places the skin is peeling. His eyes are teary and blink frequently. Noticing the approach of an outsider, the last legger quickly gathers up everything set out there which he has not yet eaten, presses his mess tin to his chest, falls to the ground, and curls up in a ball like a hedgehog. 
and now he can be beaten, shoved, but he is firmly on the ground, he won't stir, and he won't give up his mess tin. N.K.G. speaks to him in a friendly voice, and the hedgehog uncurls a bit. He sees his visitor, does not intend to beat him or take away his mess tin. A conversation ensues. They are both engineers, N.G. a geologist, and Y. a chemist. And now Y. discloses to G. his own faith. Basing himself on his still-remembered formulas for the chemical composition of substances, he demonstrates that one can get everything nutritionally necessary from refuse. One merely has to overcome one's squeamishness and direct all one's efforts to extracting nourishment from this source. Notwithstanding the heat, Y is dressed in several layers of clothes, all dirty. And he had a basis for this too. Y had established experimentally that lice and fleas will not multiply in extremely dirty clothing, as though they themselves were squeamish. Therefore, he had even picked out for one of his undergarments a piece of wiping in the repair shop. Here was how he looked. He wore a Budeni helmet with a black candle stump in place of the spiked peak. The helmet was covered with scorch marks. In some places hay and in some places oakum adhered to the greasy elephant ears of the helmet. From his outer clothing, torn pieces and tatters stuck out like tongues on his back and sides. Patches and patches a layer of tar on one side. The cotton wool lining was hanging out in a fringe along the hem. Both outer sleeves were torn to the elbows, and when the last legger raised his arms, he looked like a bat shaking its wings. And on his feet were boat-like rubber overshoes glued together from red automobile tires. Why was he dressed so warmly? In the first place, the summer was short and the winter long, and it was necessary to keep everything he had for the winter, and where else could he keep it except on himself? In the second place, the principal reason he created by this means a soft and well-padded exterior, and thus did not feel pain when he was struck. He could be kicked and beaten with sticks without getting bruised. This was his one defense. All he had to do was be quick enough to see who was about to strike him, drop to the ground in time, pull his knees up to his stomach, thus covering it, press his head down to his chest and embrace it with his thickly padded arms. Then the only places they could hit him were padded. And so that no one should beat him for too long at a time, it was necessary quickly to give the person beating him a feeling of triumph. And to this end, Y had learned to howl hideously like a piglet from the very first blow, even though he wasn't hurting in the least. For in camp they are very fond of beating up the weak, not only the work assigners and the brigadiers, but the ordinary zecks as well, so as not to feel completely weak themselves. And what was to be done if people simply could not believe in their own strength unless they subjected others to cruelty? And to why this seemed a fully endurable and reasonably chosen way of life, and one, in addition, which did not require him to soil his conscience. He did nobody harm. He hoped to survive his term. The interview with the last legger is over.